everyone see this? This is my Tourette's twitch. It happens when I get bullshit thrown in my face. So what was uh, that twitch for? Well, I wish I had this earlier today because I was doing a lot of this and I did not have my proper PPE to prevent a possible concussion. Well, anyway. We're going to be talking about the Meister tracks today, and this crap was debunked in the 1980s. And a video appears on my feed today, titled, hold on, phone is turning sideways, 500 million year old human footprint fossil baffles scientists. We are going to watch parts of this video, not the whole thing. It's uh, 7 minutes 43 seconds long, and I don't want this to be 30 minutes, because I'm going to have to give you some background, because when actually doing real research, you need some background on some things other than just clicking your confirmation bias. All right, so let's get started. Yes, I am gorilla shooting this, because my video watching software still is not working, and unless you're going to pay for it, either deal with it or don't watch it. I really don't care. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for watching Beyond Science, it's Mike Chen. Now, before we jump into today's topic, I just want to give a shout out to Audible, the sponsor of this video, and I'll talk more about my okay, favorite audio Okay, here he is, plugging his sponsor, anyway, it's fine, Archaeology is one of my favorite topics on this channel because... Okay, now he says archaeology here, but technically if he's talking about 500 million, million year old rocks, that would be paleontology, but the sheer fact that he... Uh, you know, I mean, if there were human footprints in this stuff, I guess it would merge the two. But he starts off not on a good note here. Well, that's how we're able to get a glimpse of our past. I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of crazy because everything we know or think we know about where we came from, our planet, the timeline of human history, basically has all been based on clues that we have uncovered. And those clues could be an ancient text, some age-old bombs, or prehistoric fossils. So essentially... Yeah, texts are somewhat reliable. You got to be careful with that. I mean, if you're talking about real hard evidence, you need physical evidence. I mean, you can write down whatever you want. I mean, people tell stories all the time. But anyway, that's all right. Let's continue. We base most of what we know about how our planet was formed, our ancestors, and how they lived. We based all this stuff on clues that we have found. Now, this planet is pretty big, and it's filled with this a ton pretty cool of footage. unexplored forests, undiscovered caves, mysterious waters, basically places where so many more clues could be out there, some of which could drastically alter our version of history. What I'm saying is our version of history, what we know of Bait now setting. could be very limited because we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. He's so right on that though, we don't. The way it goes is that modern humans have been around for about 200,000 years. Doesn't... Now before that, we were Neanderthals. And then going back for- Stop, right there. Modern hum homo sapiens were never Neanderthals. Homo sapiens and Neanderthals evolved from Homo heidelbergensis and later closer to modern times, well, 30,000 years ago or whatever, were, came back into the same area. Neanderthals and humans were separated for at least 150,000 years, maybe 100,000 years, somewhere in that range. Evolution is not a line. It does not create a species which begats another, which begats another, which begats another. That's not how it works. And that's kind of the uh, impression he's giving here. So once I got to this part, I was like at the beginning, I'm like, okay, let's see what he has. Let's see what he has. And then I heard this. And that's when the twitching really got going there, the Tourette's twitch. Okay, he's going to talk about when this discovery was made, and he does get it correct, at least in the beginning. Literally, because in the summer of 1968, an amateur fossil collector, William J. Meister, made the discovery of a lifetime 43 miles west of Delta, Utah. To his surprise, he found a fossil... Okay, that 45 miles west... Um, we're going to find out this is from found from a place called Antelope Springs, which I'm going to get into. Um, it was really hard for me to find out which one. You're going to see the fact that when I Google Earth, it like half a dozen locations came up. But you're going to see later how I think his assumption there is correct based on something else I found. And we're going to have to roll with it, but I'll get into that in a minute. Human footprint, but what's even more strange is that well, it's not just a footprint, it was a shoe print, a modern shoe print with a heel about the size of a US 13 shoe. Okay, yeah, and that's where it just derailed. The train went from okay, let's be objective, to just derailing into the gully, and he's gonna get into some more 
woo-woo here a little bit, but I am going to go back to that and show you better pictures of that than this gorilla shoot, and I'm going to explain to you why these are not footprints. important is that, well, trilobites only existed between 260 to 600 million years ago. Now, it's actually more like 540 million years ago. Researchers believe humans emerged now, that trilobite fossil is legitimate. Ago, this, really only began just one thing I want to mention first, this find does seem legitimate. Other professionals have looked at it. It is a real thing. It is not fabricated, but it is also not a human footprint. And wearing shoes a few thousand years ago. Now, as one might expect, this sends shockwaves to the scientific communities with excitement for a new paradigm shift as well as skeptic. Okay, now here he's baiting. He's making erroneous claims. There was no paradigm shift. There was nothing like that. He's just trying to get you to watch at this point. Denial. Now, after discovering the fossil, Meister took the Wait, let's, to the let's go denial. back there. Now, after discovering the fossil, Meister is with excitement for a new paradigm shift as well as skeptical denial. Now, after discovering the fossil, notice he said skeptical denial and not skeptical analysis. A um, little switch of words there to make it sound like everybody, all legitimate, legitimate scientists just pushed this aside and said, no, this isn't real, this is BS, uh, we're going to ignore it, which is not what happened. And a simple Google search, as much as I hate to say that, will show that. The fossil Meister took the rock to Melvin Cook, a professor of metallurgy at the... Okay, that seems correct. And notice he said professional per, ah, professor of metallurgy. Now he's going to about to make a totally baseless claim here that is easily shown not to be true. University of Utah, who suggested he show it to the university's geologists. But according to reports, none of the geologists were willing to examine it. So my... According to the reports, none of the geologists were willing to examine it. Citation, please because geologists have looked at this, which I'm going to get into when you're done selling your pile of shit. Now we're going to get into the part where someone who is not qualified to speak as the validity of this is going to give their opinion on it, and he's going to give that point of view, but isn't going to give the alternate points of view. And Dr. G. Lydiard Stebbins of the University of California at the Confirmation base. bias. Reportedly at the debate, Reverend Boswell said, I have here something that pretty much destroys the entire geological column. It has this. Yeah, that's nice. Reverend isn't a scientist, has no. He has no scientific degree. He has no concept of the geologic column that I'm aware. He just spat that out. Creationists have been saying that since the 19th century, and it's still around, I mean, the geologic column. Studied by three laboratories around the world, and it's been tested and found them. I couldn't find anything about three laboratories around the world, but I do know from what I've seen that all he's saying here is that it is a real thing found on the ground. It's not fabricated, but that doesn't mean it's a footprint. Valid. It represents a footprint that was found at Antelope Springs, Utah, while digging for trilobites. The man was digging for trilobites, and these are trilobites here and here embedded. This is a brick mold of a trilobite footprint of a... Uh, this is the mold. I'm going to show you a picture of the original because a mold is just a mold and doesn't tell you about the surrounding sediment and the surrounding geology, which would be crucial in doing any real objective analysis, which I will get into. Yes, this video really triggered me. A human footprint with a trilobite in it. The man stepped on the living trilobite, thus burying him in the mud. This particular strata is dated Cambrian, supposedly. Okay, I want you to remember what he just said. This man stepped in the mud and on a trilobite. Trilobites are marine animals. They have never been discovered to be terrestrial animals. This is before life moved on land. And we know they're marine by the surrounding sediment, which I'm going to get into later. So unless this guy was holding his breath, Walking on a sea bottom, he didn't step on any trilobite, all right? But just remember that. I used to believe that these are really footprints of modern humans from hundreds of million years ago, Warden. What I choose to believe is irrelevant. If I can't show it, I don't know it. Um, I can believe whatever I want, it doesn't make it reality. And this, the Meister print is so easily debunked and has been for decades now. That I can't believe a video in 2018 is using this, but 
And let's let the guy finish. Not? That's really up to you. But clues like this have been found all around the world. And to me, just because they're really not allotted by mainstream scientists doesn't diminish their existence. Also, of course, the... And see, he's sitting. He, he's setting this up to make mainstream scientists look guilty of something that they're not. But he immediately, right off the bat, in the beginning of his video, not only defined archaeology kind of incorrectly, which I gave him a pass on because of the situation, he clearly doesn't understand evolution or is trying to mislead you. Um, and he didn't even address the debunking that has done, been done for the past 30 years on this stuff. So we have a term for this. It's called cherry picking. Oh, the kicker's coming up. Existence. Also, of course, this is my own personal opinion. I feel like... Yes, exactly. It's your own personal opinion. You're not an expert. And I looked you up, bud. You're not a geoscientist either. I do like some of your videos. They are entertaining. But as a valid piece of science, they don't work. Um... So, and I left a lengthy comment on his channel, which I'll scroll down if I can find it so you could read it. It's generally got positive responses, which surprised me a lot. So this leads me to think that this channel at least has people on it that are uh, not just easily led by the nose, I guess you would say. But um, yeah, let's see what else he has to say. It's really pompous to think that, yes, we have everything figured out. Like. It's pompous to say we have everything figured out. We do not have everything figured out. Uh, that is something non-scientists say. No legitimate scientist would ever say that. We know there is vastly, vast amounts of things we do not know. If we thought we knew everything, science would stop. And it hasn't, because we know we don't know everything. Oh wait, I promised to show you my comment, so we'll scroll down. Here it is, right here. You can read it if you want. What I have here in my hand is a hand specimen of a rock. I wet it to get some of the dirt off. It's drying out a little bit. As you can see, I do that. It gets wet again. <clears throat> Something you need to know about a hand specimen is unless I have accurate documentation where this came from and I can let someone else give them an exact location so they can go out and find out for themselves, all I can get from this are mechanical chemical properties. I can look at this with a hand lens and tell you that it's a purple ferrous quartzite with a hematite band in it. All right. I can run other tests on it, you know, just to see what this thing is. I can do that and possibly put it into basically igneous sedimentary or metamorphic. But all this right here tells me nothing of the origin of this rock. You need the bigger picture. You need to step out. This actually is from a banded iron formation in the Upper Peninsula. I pulled this off of US-41. Of US now, so I know that's what it is. But these type of quartzites are also found surrounded by white quartzites. And this could have been from the side of a hydrothermal vein or something like that. This in my hand can only tell me what it is made of and how it stands to mechanical test. It tells me absolutely nothing about its definite origin, its age, or anything. All right? Now I could pull zircons from this and get a minimum age, but unless I have that field relationship, I cannot determine exactly the origin of this rock. All right, so how do we analyze this objectively? How do we step back and get that bigger picture? Well, these are two photos. The one on the left is cited on the next slide, so I didn't cite it here. This is, from what I can tell, is the original. And the photo on the right, the link is below. And it didn't say, but I think this, this might be the original or a cast uh, of the original or mold. I don't know. But the only reason why I put it on the right here is to show you the tri trilobite. Now, as I've said before, that it seems that this is a legitimate rock. Okay? It's not fake. It's not concrete or Portland cement or anything like that. Okay? Fossil wasn't stuck in there to make it look like anything. But I want you to look at this. And this black arrow is pointing to the trilobite. The one on the right is a zoom in of that. I want you to get a good look at the shape of this. All right? It's very hard to find good pictures of this 
online. And the one on the right, by looking at it, it looks to me like this might be a silty limestone. All right. And I'm going to explain why I came to that conclusion. It may not be. It may just be a silt stone. I, I don't know because I don't have it in my hand. And that, <laughs> that is also important. All right. All right, so the, when he sat there and said no one has objectively looked at this, no scientists, and they just all blew it off and dismissed it, here's the website where I got this from. And in, if you look down, you can see that Comrade1981 did a very uh, detailed debunking of this. And there are others listed here too, so that is complete BS. Now, at the bottom here, it mentions the uh, Wheeler uh, Shale, and I'm going to get back to that. Uh, but first, I need to show you a crash. I'm going to give you a crash course of what a, of what, a, of what sequence stratigraphy is. This here, link below, is a marine transgression. Now, when sea level rises, you get a certain pattern of sediments. And the, this is just the textbook. It does depend on where the rock is being originated from and the temperature of the water and things like su that, such. But this is just to show you what sequence stratigraphy is. So you typically get in a section here, you'll get a sandstone overlain by a shale, <clears throat> overlain by a limestone. All right. Um, so that shows you a transgression. Now, during the regression, we would get the opposite of that. All right, because sea level does raise and it does drop. All right, just remember that for now. So I went and looked at that Antelope Springs in Utah. I googled it, and this is what came up. <sighs> at least half a dozen places. But in the video, the guy did say it was what about 50 miles ish or so, or 40 miles west of Delta, and so that. I wasn't going to take his word for it because of the first minute he made a bunch of erroneous errors in his uh, statements. But it does check out, which I used that previous slide a couple back, would mention the Wheeler Formation, and it puts it at, in the Wheeler Formation. So we're just going to go with that because the exact location was never given. To anybody making any discovery in the field if you're an amateur, Field Notes 101, put your location as accurately as you can preferably gps coordinates if you don't have that draw a map give distances pace it out do what you have to do that's field notes 101 there's a reason why field notes are called field notes and journals are called journals journals are just your opinion how you feel whatever a field notes are objective observations so please remember that if you think you found something interesting just do that for me, would you? Okay, so I went and looked about the basic geology of the Wheeler uh, Shale, or formation. Uh, and it is Cambrian. He got that right. About 500, 510 million years old, somewhere in there. This is a U.S. Geological Survey Bulletin 1948 that came out in 1991. Um, it shows the stratigraphy of the area. If you look to the lower right, you can see Wheeler Shale. Um, but this is just to give you a stratigraphic, you get you your, what we call stratigraphic bearings. Um, very important in geology to know the stratigraphy of an area so you can correlate things and make targeted searches for what you're looking for if you're looking for something specific or if you're just mapping in general. You need a basic stratigraphic framework. None of that was given in old boy's video. None of that, okay? But we're going to go to a thesis now. This, both of these are free online. Uh, you can get them. All right. So what I want to show you here is, well, that's the actual thesis and where you can get it. If you type that in, I'll get it. Okay, Utah. As you can see, the photo here on the left, the Wheeler Formation is off to the west side of Utah. That line in the middle is the Paleo Equator during that time because North America has moved due to plate tectonics. All right. So the Wheeler seems to be a delta deposit. All right, uh, mixed with uh, shallow marine sediments. All right, and it was tectonically active. So I'm not going to get into the, the structural geology of this. I'm just going to touch on it because that really complicates things. Over here on the right, you had the Wheeler Formation. Here's a stratigraphic column on the far right. In the middle, it's a zoom in of a certain bit of stratigraphy. Now, granted, this thesis is very in depth. 
very complicated, but it does sit here and make you go, hmm, about those footprints. The structural geology I mentioned, this is all I'm going to show you right here. The beds dip, all right? So we know there's a tectonic activity in the past. Here is stratigraphy of the actual wheel, Wheeler Formation measured sections. Off the far left, it tells you uh, in the increments the measured section. On the far right is the legend for the lithology of everything that's encountered here. And what I've learned from this is that it is dominantly a shale, all right? There are some limestones, but mostly this was a high-standing trans marine transgression, okay? Because like I showed you in that generic uh, slide of sequence stratigraphy, shales and limestones tend to be deposited offshore, and we know trilobites are marine in origin, all right? You can read this if you want. This is uh, this is just touching on that structural geology in a little more detail. Okay. Um, the top of the formation is marked with stromatolites, and stromatolites require sunlight in shallow water to grow. And today they're seen in tidal pools in Australia. There are freshwater versions. They are found in lakes and stuff. But the mounds, the balls, uh, those are marine. All right, very shallow marine. And the top of this formation has this. It tells us the seas withdrew. You don't get stromatolites in water deeper than a couple dozen feet, all right, without high tide variation. They just won't grow, okay? So you know the sea had to have retreated. Now, there are units stratigraphically above the Wheeler that show another transgression, but we're not going to talk about that because that's not the focus of this. Here on the right is what we call sea level curve. The left has the basic uh, <clears throat> strat generic stratigraphy, shows you formations above and below. But on the right here, it's a sea level curve. It shows you, based on the lithology, the relative depth of sea level, showing you minor transgressions and regressions, showing you um, a high stand systems tract. That means a consistently over a high, higher transgression. Okay, so the seas were coming up on the land. So at the bottom, you have a low standing, then you have a transgressive system, and then you have a high stand system, and then you have a low stand system when the seas began to regress. This is a typical marine sequence. All right, and well, how do we know this is actually what happens? Well, because we use sequence stratigraphy to look for off offshore resources like oil. All right, and if this isn't what we saw, we would be blind drilling and we'd have no clue. But we use this as our model because it accurately shows how different lithologies relate to one another so we can target our search for resources. We wouldn't use sequence stratigraphy to look for oil if it wasn't known to work. The model works, all right? So this <laughs> shows us that you would have had a marine environment, all right? Um, so that's the whole thing with this footprint thing. And I'll touch it back on it in a minute. I'm going to end the slides. First. Okay, so remember what I just showed you about sequence stratigraphy. Uh, shales are offshore deposits, even shallow ones, okay? So if the, and so are limestones further down. So if this is a footprint in a muddy limestone, Whoever left it must have been walking underwater. For the sake of argument, we will say that the sea transgressed for a day or two and it was just muddy and this guy just happened to walk along the new beach and then, or the tide really pulled out for some bizarre reason. And so, and this guy walked across and left his footprint. Well, <clears throat> there are other ways to show that this is not a human footprint. Um, we have what's called spall weathering. And I have a video uh, coming up here where I'm going to show you how spall weathering. I have an example of it in my backyard. All right. Then I'm going to try to recreate the footprint. All right. And what you're going to see, because if you look at that photo, just go back and look. You can tell by the shadows. It's very flat and comes almost straight down with a slight angle towards the outside. So basically, whoever would must have been walking to make this footprint must have had their uh <laughs> must have had their leg bone their ankle 
towards the center of their foot, not towards the back. And they must have been slightly bow-legged. You're going to see me walk kind of oddly to try to reproduce this. It doesn't really work. Not only that, but if you just wanted to sit there and just think about it logically, if someone's walking along a muddy flat or near a beach, do they generally do it with their shoes on? Most people I know at the beach take their shoes off. Some people do like me, but I'm feral, so, you know, that's different. But, you know, this logic, you usually don't trek through sticky, goopy mud with your shoes on. Uh, but that's just food for thought or whatever. But let's get into my observational videos here. I don't need to go very far to see spalling mechanical weathering at work. We built this shed in June of last year, 2017. This deck was built in July. This was poured when the deck was built. Portland cement. Now, after winter of freeze thawing, this has occurred on the top. Now, we probably should have put a protective coat on this. That was my lack of foresight. However, it demonstrates spalling perfectly. And we get shapes of different sizes and orientations in the concrete. Nothing magical, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh-oh. This one kind of looks like a, I don't know, a, a ladle. Oh my god. I think I found a, a fossilized ladle. See what I mean? Alright, let's go on to the next bit. Okay, I'm going to hand the phone over to Sarah in a sec, but first I just wanted to try to show you. I'm going to try to reproduce those footprints the best that I can. Um, the soil here is looks like it would be similar to the soil in that photo, and I already went through how those footprints are not footprints and why, but here I'm going to try to replicate it. So first I'm going to walk normally through one and then I'm going to try to reproduce that. And it's gonna look like a real funky walk, but here, Sarah's gonna hold it. And then we're gonna analyze it. All right, first one's first, normal walk, right? Okay, now I'm gonna try to walk out to get that flat. Something like that. So, let's see if it works. Walking normally, as you can see, <sighs> try to get a best, you get it, because humans walk, heel to toe, heel to toe. You get a deep imprint and a rise around the heel, not so much on the toe. We see it there. Now this sediment's a little, the soil's a little soft, but you, Kind of helps illustrate the point a lot more. See, you get deep heel and toe. And this one is not as soft, but you can see you see heel to toe with an arch in the middle. These are none of these are flat at all. We look at this one here, where I kind of had to walk funny. And even though I was trying to walk flat footed, I still came down heel first because why? Well, most of the weight's on the heel of the foot, not on the front. This one's not as good, but same thing, you can see the heel. And this one looks flatter, but it's also slightly inclined. So even trying, now this one, I got the side thing going pretty good, and then shallow on the other side, but the heel is still deeper than the toe. So it's really difficult to walk and create a flat footprint. Okay, so that went way longer than anticipated. Um, I'm gonna try to edit this down a lot. But anyway, if you have any comments, uh, leave them below. Um, please share this if you can. Subscribe if you haven't already. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, I will entertain them. But anyway, that's it, and I hope you learned something.